The rolling wolds of Lincolnshire are a far cry from the battlefields of the First World War, but when war broke out in 1914, thousands of men enlisted to fight for king and country. By the end of the war in 1918, millions had lost their lives, never to return to the green fields of home. This is the story of one Lincolnshire man's journey to the front line from his home. <laughs> Ernest George Croft Rose was aged 34 when he enlisted with the 8th Battalion Lincolnshire Regiment at Grimsby in July 1915. He was old compared to the many who'd enlisted. He died eight days after his 35th birthday on April the 28th 1917, his body remaining in France. He didn't receive a VC or a DSO or anything for gallantry. He was just one of many men who decided to enlist and help their country. And at the end of the day, they're all heroes for what they had to go through. He also happens to be my great grandfather. He was born here in South Killingholm in 1882, the son of Robert and Mary Ann Rose, and he spent his life in agriculture, working as a farm labourer. Well, from the census and the maps, I'm not sure which house the family lived in. The cottages that exist on the map uh, behind me, they've all now been demolished. But the lady in the cream house has just come out and told me that at one time her house was two farm cottages. So it could have been that the family lived there. If not, there's another house just around the corner at the Baptist Chapel. We know very little about Ernest, or George as it seemed he was known. His son, my grandfather, died when I was 15 and at that age I wasn't interested in where the family came from. I wish I'd spoken to him and uncovered more about this man with a warm smile. My search for more about him took me to Grimsby Central Library, where there was plenty of information to be gleaned. So Tracy, you've got lots of information here in front of us about my great-grandfather. Mm -hmm. Just talk to you. I mean, you've got some sensors here. What, I mean, what can we learn about him? Well, we can learn a, an awful lot, actually. This is from the 1891 census for South Killingholm. Right. And we can see, at the time, he was living with his family... Um, his father, Robert Rose, the head of the family, married. He was aged 46 there. Right. And he was a plate layer. This is an entry from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. They have a site, uh, the Debt of Honour Register. Right. And we did manage to find Ernest George. And it gives the details. His private number, 8th Battalion, Lincolnshire Regiment, who died aged 35. It gives the date. Mm hmm And the husband of Rosetta Rose and it tells you where he's buried in the military cemetery in France. So what do we know? In 1901 his work on the land took him to a village called Willoughby where he worked on a farm in Olford Road. The farm still stands today but back then was farmed by a William Parker whose wife Caroline was born in Stallingborough. On May the 18th, 1908, Ernest married Rosetta Ladlow at St Helen's Church in Barnaby-Lebec. He was 26 years old and she was 30. 
an age at which many marry today, but then was considered old. In February 1909, they were joined by the birth of their son George and in 1911 by a daughter called Ina. The family lived at number 52 High Street next to the Ship Inn. An old postcard shows my grandfather standing outside the house in 1912. No family papers appear to exist and it was difficult trying to piece together who he was until I met two sisters in their 80s. Their parents had been very good friends of the Roses and when on leave, Ernest would visit their father. And I remember Mum saying once and Dad, they said when he came home on leave at the army, he always used to go to Dad. Yeah. And he said, uh, and Dad said, cheerio to him when he went back. I said, oh, he said, that, that's no, it's no good. And that's a snow, it's no good, and he got coming, you see. Uh... I said, oh, that's no, that, that's, that's no good. I'm not, I'm not, and that's, that's something no good. Yeah. So he knew, really. He'd say, so he must have known something. Yeah. So it seems Ernest had a sense of foreboding that he would never return to England and see his family and friends again. I'm sure that was a feeling everyone on the front had. They were just part of the poor bloody infantry. But what happened on the farms when all these men went to war? Certain professions had been excluded from joining up, but by 1916 Kitchener needed more men and it was opened up. For a farm labourer, the lure of better pay and regular meals seemed far better than life on the land. Food production had fallen by 1916 due to disruption in imports. By early 1917, the British were starving. Meat became a luxury for the working classes. Well, agriculture had actually been in the doldrums for some time, um, but of course the, the great home demand upon the start of the war, uh, farmers actually started making profits. Um, and they, they weren't uh, sharks or rip-off people, they certainly didn't make any huge amounts of money, but actual farmers did actually see themselves making profits as a result of this, um, the great demand for the uh, arable products. Many in the countryside turned to poaching and pilfering. Rabbit would have been on the menu. Using nets and ferrets, there would have been many a rabbit for the pot. Disruption was felt on the farms as horses were taken away for the war effort, never to return like so many men, and tractor power was introduced, which was to change the way the land was farmed. A lot of agricultural workers went, they were all volunteers, they all thought this famous phrase, it will be over by Christmas. And one of the local uh, major landowners and farmers was the Earl of Ancaster, and he actually said to his men, oh, I'll hold your jobs open uh, until you come back. And of course, uh, sadly, uh, many of them just didn't come back. Um, and as the war went on, more and more uh, were called out. Uh, there was conscription was introduced in 1916. Uh, so this did have a, a great effect. Um, so in, it was again in 1916 that the Women's Land Army was formed um, and these were, were volunteer women from the country and the towns who uh, went out to, to work on the land. They also brought in children. Um, in, in Lindsay area of Lincolnshire they had changed the school holidays so that the children would be available to come and do the uh, potato harvest. Um, and, and things like that went on. They, they brought in prisoners of war. Um, and even men on leave, although they didn't take very kindly to uh, being asked to do farm work whilst on, on leave. By Christmas 1915, over two million men had volunteered for Kitchener's new army. These men came from all walks of life, eager to do their duty. The 8th Battalion of the Lincolnshire Regiment was formed at the outbreak of the uh, World War I. Um, along with many other battalions around the country, and they became what was known as uh, Kitchener's Army. The poster of the Secretary of State for War is one of the images of the Great War that many people remember. <laughs> 
With the call of your country needs you, many of the men in our region would have come here to the barracks on Victoria Street, now home to a printing firm. Obviously you needed to be fit and healthy to join the army. But in 1914, there was such an influx of enthusiastic young men that some of those checks were pretty cursory. And I've spoken to veterans, certainly of the 10th Battalion Lincolns, who were told by the recruiting sergeant that if they walked around the block and gave him a different age, then they would be recruited. At one time, this was the barracks for the famous 10th Lincolns, a PALS battalion, affectionately dubbed the Grimsby Chums. The building still shows signs of its former life. Its drill hall now resounds to the sounds of printing presses. The stairs to the first floor are very ornate, and upstairs is a hidden gem, a rather grand bathroom, used only by the officers. It may have been here that Ernest came with many others to take up the King's call to arms. Who knows what made him and many others enlist? There was great enthusiasm to enlist and Kitchener's appeal um, cut through the normal recruiting programme and everybody was keen to get in before the war was over by Christmas 1914. That was their perception that it was going to finish very quickly. Private 18657 joined the 8th Battalion, which was formed in September 1914. Due to heavy losses, it wasn't entirely made up of men from Lincolnshire. The 8th Battalion was formed in Lincoln in September 1914. And like a lot of the service battalions, they spent some time training in Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire until they were sent to France and they went to France in September 1915. Though he'd enlisted in the summer of 1915, I couldn't find out when he actually went to France. From his medals, I know he hadn't fought that year. The standard thing to mark the passing of a soldier was known as the death plaque, um, which was a bronze plaque the size of a, uh, a saucer, basically. The medals for service overseas were also received in the early 1920s. My search for the man was taking me closer to where he was killed. He died of wounds picked up at one of the battles of Arras in northern France. If it had not been so bad, he would have been sent home to Blighty to recover, but sadly never made it. Like Mary Dobbs said when I visited her, on one of his last visits home, Ernest seemed to know he would never return home again to see his wife and children. He'd already felt the effects of war and knew what it was capable of doing. At Easter, I made the trip to France, tracing his steps down to the south coast and Dover for a ferry to Boulogne, the trip he probably would have made. Unfortunately, due to a French blockade, they were keeping the English out today in protest against their government's new law to sack people under 26 without a reason. It could have been so different if the Kaiser had won the war. Boats left England in the cover of night, laden with troops for the Western Front. Boulogne was the first view of France many of the regiments would have had and from here they were sent down the coast to eat tap or eat apples as the English called it. Here they received basic training in open air bull rings and prepared for the front line. There were also several military hospitals around this fishing port so for many it was the first and last place as many returned for burial. From Etap to Arras, a journey by car of an hour and a half, then maybe a day. Life in the trenches had its problems. As well as keeping oneself alive, they had to contend with being eaten alive by lice, the smell of decomposing bodies, mud, mildew and rats was another aspect of life at the front.
The battles of April 1917 left the Lincolnshire Regiment severely depleted and they were withdrawn from the front line on the 29th for rest, recuperation and reinforcement. The fighting at Arras was seen as more lethal than the battles of the Somme and it's a battle that's not easily recognised by many. The battles of Arras uh, were made up of several different attacks. It uh, started off on the 9th of April 1917 and the weather conditions were appalling. There was a lot of snow, very cold weather, uh, the troops suffered badly from exposure, basically living in open ditches. Um, you can imagine the effect on people's health, quite apart from the obvious dangers from the enemy. So the battles opened up on the 9th of April and there were subsequent battles uh, the 8th Lincolns were committed on the 10th of April, 23rd of April and the 28th of April. Um, uh, Monchi was one of the battle areas and Ruhr, the chemical works at Ruhrx um, was another one towards the end of the month. But the reason I think that the battles of Arras have been overlooked is that the Somme inflicted appalling casualties on a lot of the new army battalions of which the 8th Lincolns was one. And it, the effects of that battle um, with the civilian soldiers, if you like, the chaps who were recruited in that heady period of 1914, has passed into the national folklore. At 05.30 hour on Easter Monday, April the 9th, the 8th Lincolns went over the top. They knew nothing about the overall strategy. Their duty was to capture Orange Hill on the outskirts of Monchi le Preux. The weather was appalling. It was bitterly cold and snowing. The men were without their greatcoats for they'd had to leave them behind as they were carrying half their body weight in equipment and had had to crawl through the sewers of Arras to get there. Many suffered from exposure and exhaustion. By midnight they were established on the northern half of the hill. The 8th Lincolns were on the left. They made another attempt to advance but were stopped by heavy machine gun fire. Eventually were ordered into Monchi but once again came under barrage and machine gun fire as they tried to push the Germans back beyond the Hindenburg line. Capturing the village was key to unhinging the fortified line. Victory eventually came and to commemorate the heroics of the 37th Division, a statue was erected in the village with three life-size figures. It's tribute to the battalions who fought for three days and nights with little sleep and rest in atrocious weather conditions to capture the grand prize of war in the Battle of Arras. The second Arras battle on St George's Day saw the battalions attack Greenland Hill, north of the Scarp, between Gavrel and Rue Chemical Works. The men were by now tired from the heavy fighting earlier in the month. The French were on the point of mutiny and overhead the air battle raged with the German fighter aces, the Red Baron and Jaster Bolker taking more victories. At the heart of the battle was a rolling barrage to screen the troops as they crossed no man's land. However, they'd not anticipated the Germans' underground fortresses, home to the gunners. The English lost their way and there were horrific losses on all sides. 524 of the Lincolns were casualties, half of the battalion's strength. The battle left 30,000 dead and over 188,000 injured. Ernest was most probably one of those injured. On the 29th, the battalion was withdrawn from the front line, a mere skeleton of its former self. With me on my journey were my parents. For my mother, the journey to find her grandfather was emotional. 
Can you explain to us then what are going to be your expectations of visiting your grandfather's grave for the first time? Um, my expectations are that I think I'm going to be very nervous. Um, nobody within the family, as far as I know, has ever visited his grave. So I'll be the first person to ever come to France and, and see his gravestone. So it's sort of a mixture of trepidation and all sorts of feelings. The 8th Lincolns fought alongside the 8th Somerset Light Infantry at Arras, in which the poet Siegfried Sassoon belonged. It was during the Second Battle of the Scarp that he suffered a shoulder wound. Unlike Ernest, he survived and came home to Blighty to recover. On receiving an injury in action, the men would walk or be stretchered to the regimental aid post. Those beyond help would be made comfortable and left to die. A field ambulance would then take the others to the advance clearing station where better treatment was possible. Because so many who reached there died, there are to be found on the fields many cemeteries. It was here that the doctors worked to save lives. For many, they were saved and left here by train for a base hospital or on to the French coast and hopefully the journey home. Finally, nearly 90 years after his death, we were able to find his grave and see where Ernest was buried at Etap Military Cemetery, not far from the hospital where he died. It was an emotional moment for my mum and myself to see the grave. It was a sad moment, magnified by the fact the heavens opened. The cemetery, designed by Edwin Lutyens, is the resting place for thousands of men and women on both sides. For the men laid here to rest, their families would have been notified by letter of their death. Telegrams were only sent to the families of officers. One can only imagine what Rosetta must have gone through when she received the buff-coloured envelope and read the words It's my painful duty to inform, inform you, you that I write concerning the unfortunate death of your husband. Unlike so many men who were never found and lie buried under French soil in unmarked graves, Ernest and many others have a grave to remember them by. They are not forgotten. But it's a different story in his home village. This tiny parish lost 19 of its men in the war and there's no mention of them anywhere in the village. It's 92 years since the war first began in August 1914 and for some it's all quiet on the Western Front. Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead, and we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack, as they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. Stop worrying. 